Okay, so here we are again. It's Anthony back with Andy Blunden. Andy, what a pleasure to see you. Good morning. Bonjour. Good evening. Yeah, I hope you're doing well. And uh, mm -hmm. this this little interviewing thing that I'm um, doing lately really started with you. I think uh, it's 2010 or 2011. Um, mm -hmm. It's extremely helpful. Uh, I don't exactly remember how this started, but you did a, a two video series on concepts, really the development of concepts. Pre I think you asked me. Pardon? You asked me and, and I agreed. We did a couple of Skype hookups and that was my first experience of being recorded on video as well. Oh, okay, yeah. I think I think Peter Smagorinsky played the middleman somehow there, but I remember, I remember being very excited mm -hmm. about it because, um, I, you know, I knew who you were and I had been following along with obviously not all of your work because that's a massive amount, but a fair amount of what you were doing. And it was, it was really an honor. And it turned out to be a great experience for me um, because reading, thinking and speech back then for the first time was, it was really pretty over my head. And even when I'm reading it now, there's a fair amount that is confusing for me. So, so part, part of, part of what it's I'm really doing. Yeah, part of what I'm hoping to do today is just pick, pick from your expertise as much as I can. But um, before we do that, my opening question is this. Um, how would you describe your role uh, like in the Vygotsky sphere, if we can call it that? Sort of what role would you say that you play? My role? Oh, interesting. I hadn't really thought of it like that. Yes, you have an extended community and I play a certain role in that. And it's a funny kind of role because, because I took, I came into this area basically about when I retired, mm. right? And so I've never engaged uh, as a part of a, a university. Um, so my work has been very abstract, mm. yeah? Uh, and that I, I've, uh, because I have, I, what I do have uh, is a background in the same kind of Marxism, which was known to Vygotsky. A lot of the things he was reading, I read. Mm -hmm. So I, I understood what he was doing. So I, I've played a role really of clarifying and defending some really, really basic concepts of the area. And I sort of, in a sense, police them, and you know, I, I, I correct people when they garble things up and start messing around with concepts and destroying them, basically. And I work patiently a way to uh, establish the concepts of chat as part of a long lineage of, of uh, philosophical and scientific development over centuries, mm. and to use that to try and deepen those concepts. So I work at a conceptual level, and that's the way I interact with other scholars, really, who are involved in research uh, and whose immediate concerns and pra the practical needs of their work uh, has made it difficult for them to engage in that abstract level. Whereas for me, uh, I really have very limited opportunity for practical engagement. Mm. Okay, interesting. I'm going to pause here just one second. Okay. Thanks. That that is very interesting. So you're working more like kind of on the abstract, on the conceptual level, and you distinguish this mm -hmm. from the more hands-on level. Can you just talk like a minute or two about that? Yeah. Um, the difficulty that a lot of people have in understanding Vygotsky is he's writing within a certain intellectual tradition, mm -hmm. and it's no accident because the key concepts that make his work so valuable uh, come out of that tradition. You know, I've been able to uh, now definitively trace the concept of a unit of analysis to Hegel. You know, I knew for a long time in a general sense it came from Hegel, but I've, I've now found a definitive definition of it in Hegel. And it's come through Marx and uh, then to uh, and, and, and Lenin and uh, Vygotsky. And it, it's a different way of thinking. 
Uh, so that makes it difficult for people. Um, I've lost the thread of what you asked. Oh, that, that's, that's you okay. Yeah, that's okay, but you were saying that this is a different way of thinking, this, this particular tradition, including concepts like unit of analysis. Can you explain a little bit about yeah. how this is a different way of thinking that people are used to? Or, or even you could talk specifically about the concept of unit of analysis. Like. Okay. Um, Vygotsky was a Marxist and he, he, all his work was in that particular frame. It's, it's different from the mainstream of analytical science. But if you like, in a simple way, the difference between analytical science and, you know, if you like synthetic science or dialectical science or some, you know, slogan that you want to use for the other is that analytical scientists uh, attempt to break everything down into small bits and reassemble the whole out of small bits. And the, the opposite approach tends to, tries to grasp the whole and then gradually um, put the pieces together uh, that make up that whole. Put the, put the, differentiate the different organs of the body. Mm. And that's a different way of thinking. And anyone that's, that's come into Vygotsky through doing a, a degree in science or psychology or something will have been trained not to do this. So it's a bit of a leap. Now, um, uh, my basic training years ago was an engineer, but that's sort of irrelevant. My intellectual, uh, uh, what you call it, genealogy was more as a Marxist. And so, you know, Marxism is about beginning from the whole and understanding the immediate problem in relation to the whole. So uh, it's um, of sympathy with Vygotsky there. Now, the unit of analysis is the key concept that allows him to do that. As Hegel puts it, in understanding a phenomenon as a whole, as what he calls a circle, is that you have to find the simple something which is universal. Right? If you find a simple, he says, das einfach, E-I-N-F-A-C, which um, means simple, but you make it into a noun, so it's the simple, the simplest thing which he says is universal. Now that's a simple definition of a unit of analysis. Right. So Goethe was the original, well not, not quite Goethe, but Hegel got it from Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the great poet and naturalist. And, and Goethe was convinced that there was some unifying principles that united all organic beings. And that if you understand the, um, can you put it? <laughs> The unifying principle is that it's not a principle like a theory, it'll be a phenomenon, something that you can understand viscerally with your senses. And if you can grasp that, then you'll understand the whole. Right now, after he died and microscopes got better and better, eventually they, they were able to identify the microstructure of organisms and discovered the cell. Cell theory had been around for some years, but they now saw it. Uh, it was a, not just a theory, but a phenomena. And so uh, in uh, activity theory, particularly, they refer to the unit of analysis as a cell. So there's two sides to this idea of a unit of analysis. One is that the whole process is just loads and loads and loads of that unit. So for instance, water is just lots and lots of uh, water molecules, and it can be steam, it can be ice, it can be water, it can be clouds, it can be um, you know uh, glaciers, but they're all water molecules. All the different forms of water are unified by just different combinations of one little unit put together in different ways. But the other side of, of the unit of analysis, which is when the same thing is called a germ, is how something very simple itself becomes more developed. So for instance, if a nation is founded with a simple principle, 
you know, and we believe these things are eternal principles and they write down 10 sort of sentences. Then those 10 sentences expand and become more concrete. They write whole books under each, each uh, line and you end up with an entire legal system, right? Um, it, the classic example is by Marx when he says, you know, the basic, you know, thing in the world, the unit of wealth is a commodity. But he's writing at a time when, you know, money is very much established. You know, he's not ignorant of the fact that no one exchanges commodities, they buy and sell. But he said, basically, it's exchanging products. And all the business about credit and money arises by complicating and developing that original idea of exchanging things. So uh, when Vygotsky says, in, in understanding the intellect, the unit is uh, a meaningful word, then uh, he doesn't, you don't just sort of stop there. That's the, the unit, if you like, which uh, develops. And, and, and he studies its development uh, through the process of internalizing. Yeah? Um, so it's, it's also a germ cell and a unit. Now, th those are key ideas uh, invented in, in classical German philosophy, inherited by Marxism, and given such a definite, useful, uh, special form by Vygotsky that no other strain of Marxism has been able to do, right, uh, in this idea of a, of a unit of analysis. Now, um, for me, when I, I, I had a friend who was a, a, a friend of um, Lois Holtzman, and when she came back from New York in the so the late 90s, she came back with a photocopy of Thinking and Speech, the old translation, which is supposed to be terrible and you know, cutting out all the Marxism and so on, right? She gave me that and it was like sort of, you know, these, these uh, uh, road to Damascus moments. And I read this stuff, I was, okay, this guy's got it. You know, I, I connect with this guy. Um, because while for most people, Thinking and Speech is very forbidding, you know, uh, to me, I, I related to it. He was a friend. Um, and, and that was the beginning, of, one side of the you know, beginning of my journey with it, yeah. Have, I don't know if any of that's useful to you. No, very much. Have, have there been many other branches uh, 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 of the tree that maybe goes from Goethe to Hegel to elsewhere? So what I'm, what I'm saying is, has that, has that tree sort of branched in other directions as well? And is, yeah, sure is, has the, a, is the Vygotsky uh, in, still has he, is the Vygotsky in direction better, smarter, more valid, just simply different? Because uh, I don't have this history um, at all. I'll briefly tell you about that. Goethe still has a fan base of his science, but it's a bit very, very, very marginal and not much more than a fan base. Hegel, of course, has a, an enormous uh, base of, of scholarship behind him, that, uh, which is mostly uh, just interested in philosophy as such, as a pursuit of philosophy. Uh, but in amongst the Hegelians, there are also Marxists. And Marx, of course, famously has vast uh, following and influence and has generated absolutely innumerable, different, mutually hostile um, currents of, of interest. Um, and Vygotsky comes out of that. I suppose he, he makes a certain interpretation of capital. You know, in that 1929 work um, called The Crisis, he says, Vygotsky, sorry, psychology needs its own uh, capital. And, and he has a, a certain meaning of that which is the one we've just talked about to do with the unit of analysis. Um, for all the uh, analysis, endless, endless analysis of capital and endless comparison of, of capital with uh, Hegel's logic, he's the only person that's made that connection. Right? And in my view, the only reading of capital that allows you to take those uh, ideas from Marx outside the, the closed circle of discussing capital as a book. You know, I mean, there are, you, you may not know, but there are loads and loads of 
people out there that just write about capital as a work. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, and some of them go on to do what they call Marxist economics, which is something that's never much interested me, but it still remains within that. Now, what Vygotsky, by getting the, the intellectual core of the idea there, has enabled it, he applied it to psychology. And he not only applied it to psychology with um, the, the word meaning bit, but he, he, he made an invented approach to the uh, education and dealing with uh, people with disabilities mm. with a unit of analysis called a defect compensation. Yeah, and, and in other areas to do with artifact mediated actions, which sprouted a whole current as well. And there's another one. Oh, yeah, and uh, Perizvania is the development, the psychology of the development of the personality. Mm. Now, and child development, the social situation of development. So, I mean, this is like an explo creative explosion there. But he's grasped what Marx is doing, and Marx is focused on one thing to understand the mechanisms uh, of capitalist economics, because he became aware as a youth that with all the problems of the world in his time, all came down to one thing, and that was uh, the market. It says, okay, you had the peasants were being mistreated, you had censorship, you had uh, you know a lack of democracy, a lot of problems, but it all came down to that. So he just focused mainly on that one problem, not exclusively, but mainly. Now, Vygotsky was just which, 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 which is a bit of a problem in itself, is it not? When you when you sort of distill a uh, very complex phenomena into one, putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, isn't isn't no, that is isn't that no, a, isn't, no, that isn't. A, isn't that an approach that's sort of ripe for ripe for good things and disaster? Um, well, it can be. But the, the, the problem comes with, that, with the analytical approach, you see. That you, you've got an academy, that's to say the, the university yeah, in, as a world institution, that divides everything up into departments and departments within departments. Mm. Yeah, and every intellectual pursuit, every idea has its own department. Yeah, and these are fixed, rigid boundaries. And I remember as a PhD student overstepping a boundary and, and it's like a pack of dogs you know, go, Arr! get out of here, right? So the, there's an absolute uh, powerful social basis for keeping these, these divisions separate, right? Now, you are right, if, if I understand you, that saying that the, the, the pursuit of psychology is something in itself can't solve very much. I mean, you wouldn't say it's useless, but you're limited because you're always going to be putting band-aids on things. Now, band-aids are good, right? So you've got people that have a problem and the psychologist can help them, or kids that are not getting on at school, psychologists can help them. You need to do that. But generation after generation, these problems keep coming back, mm. right? So psychology can only deal with the situation, the social situation, that the person is given. It can't understand or deal with how the person got to be in that situation, right? So I came to Vygotsky not to do psychology for the exact reasons that you're identifying, um, Anthony, because I, my concern, just naturally, the way I'm born, I'm concerned with how people get in a situation. And once you can understand that, I'm saying, look here, psychologists, deal with this. But my interest is in how people get trapped in poverty, how our people get screwed up by, by all sorts of things that are in the world. Mm. But the thing is what Vygotsky did, he, he developed the idea in such a way that um, the, the conceptual framework was uh, immediately like um, interdisciplinary. Mm. Now, we've talked about this before, Anthony, the, 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 the key idea he got with um, the uh, word meaning business, the, the, the lovely triangle with subject, object, and artifact in between, is that you've got a relationship between two individuals. This is at best the unit of analysis for a psychologist. Really, it's probably just one individual on their own, which is, of course, crap because people aren't isolated atoms. But uh, 
decent psychology sees it, a problem in a relationship, and you just analyze that. But of course, how do the people get into that situation? So what Vygotsky does, <laughs> he brings into that space between two people an artifact. That artifact is a product of thousands of years of human culture. It wasn't created by the two people, but they can grab it and use it to do something or to, to influence or to convey an idea to the other person and the other person can use an artifact back. So what you've got then is like a molecule of, of human relations of one person and another, individuals, real concrete individual people, not just like a member of a set of a million, but real people um, with society as a whole represented in there. There's your molecule, it's, it's like H2O, right? Um, and with that then, that's a, a, a unit, a cell, out of which you can construct the whole problems. Mm. Now, what I, I do with this is, is I really move, um, I move out with that. I, I'm concerned with, with like historical analysis, uh, you know, politics, uh, social change, social movements and things like that. But I can use that. And I, I use these same ideas in confidence. There are people like yourself working psychologists and teachers uh, who can, um, if you like, connect those ideas at ground level. Mm. Uh, whereas if you go into a sociology department at university, they're all dealing in sort of groups and, and classes and parties and nations and so on. And there's no people there at all. Oh, people, that's in the other building over there, the psychology department. Yeah. And then, of course, if you want to find anything about the actual gray matter that makes it up, oh, that's in the medical faculty over there, right? Um, but yeah, um, my, my, my first my first exposure to Vygotsky, my first exposure to Vygotsky was was that he was kind of like a very hardcore, like interdisciplinary guy, and that was like one of his main it's like one of his main principles to try mm -hmm. to to try to go as interdisciplinary as as possible and to not get too caught up or stuck in one particular mental model from, you know, like within a discipline. Is that accurate? And that was that one of the, was that one of the things that really allowed him to distinguish himself? Yeah. I mean, there's interdisciplinary and interdisciplinary, right? Within the area of psychology, he entered a whole number of fields and revolutionized every one of them. You know, Vygotsky was to psychology like Einstein was to physics. Mm. You know, also revolutionized about five different disciplines of physics. Um, but Vygotsky was um, a psychologist. He didn't get involved in Soviet politics. You know, and he only lived to the age of 38 as it was. He wouldn't have lived that long if he'd got involved in politics. Mm. And all of the people in that school stayed the hell out of politics as far as they could. And the fact is, you could not do political or social theory in the environment in which you lived. Now, I'm not talking about the revolution. The revolution, of course, was the greatest experiment in social change in history. And that's where all these ideas came from. But in the, the period of, of Vygotsky's life and the, uh, you know, years, however many it is, 60, 50 years after that, um, were times when in the Soviet Union it was impossible to do social theory. It was almost impossible to do psychology. Luria is you know, one of the, the, the founders of Vygotsky's current, his, uh, the earliest collaborators, had to pretend to be a behaviorist, a follower of Pavlov, in order to continue working um, because cultural psychology was getting a little bit dangerous, mm. a little bit close to politics. Um, so, um, for can you say another couple sentences? Can you say another couple sentences about that? About cultural psychology yeah. getting a little bit dangerous. Vygotsky may have, it, I can put it. If you start developing a political or social theory in the Soviet Union during the time of Stalin, and you know the, the decades after that, then you are immediately in a situation where you are threatening uh, Stalin and you're probably not going to live. I mean, in those days, 
scientific disputes were, were solved with a gun. And it's no, it's no fun. You know, I've been in lesser situations in the Trotskyist movement, weren't solved with a gun, but could be solved with a good kick in the shins. Um, and you can't do science like that. When you can't talk openly and honestly to people, you can't do science. So when, after um, Vygotsky died, as a, if I'm not mistaken, Luria abandoned psychology and went into neuroscience. And then the war started and he made his career dealing with all these brain damaged soldiers that came back from the great war. Hmm. And, and, you know, the irony it is, of course, all these damaged brains were a fantastic resource for developing neuroscience. And he's the founder of neuroscience. But he didn't go into neuroscience because he fancied it. It, it was to stay alive. Mm. Because if he had carried on doing cultural psychology, he would have got a bullet in the back of the head. I mean, this is why some of your Russian friends um, have problems with activity theory. Because activity theory was the current of Vygotsky's thinking, which continued on publicly during the Stalin era. Look, I'm not an expert on this, and I could get things garbled, right? But, um, I mean, Leontief got to be like a member of the Academy of Sciences and things. He, he reached that kind of level of, of acceptance and, and developed a following and so on. Um, whereas Vygotsky was uh, really suppressed, regarded as dangerous and not really very much talked about. It continued to exist. People continued to read his books, but it was a touchy subject that you didn't want to get too much into, right? Um, so, and it's some of the on test stuff. I mean, it's awful, some of it. I don't know if you've, there's in uh, the Journal of East European, uh, European, East European and Russian Psychology, they published some letters from Leontief, including one where he's denouncing Vygotsky as an idealist. And it's, it's just, terrible writing. I mean, it, it, it exhibits why it would be impossible to do proper science in those circumstances, because it's rubbish what he says, right? And this is, you know, this is a great thinker, quite honestly. Uh, you know, Leontief has limitations and made mistakes, but there's also wonderful ideas in there. And yet, and he's, he's you know, whatever. You, see? Yeah, you can see it's, tor it's tortured writing. Um. Yeah. See, one of the things, I know that you're interested in the different currents here. Um, see, a, you know, cultural historical theory, cultural historical activity theory. Yeah, I'm curious psychology. about the, the yeah, the, what you see is the distinction no. between the two, like what, CHT, I really CHT. don't care about the distinctions. Okay. I don't care about the distinction between the different names. I try and pick up the signals. So if you leave the A out of chat, you're saying you're distancing yourself from the activity theorists, right? Uh, and I can understand that. I've just said some things about Leontief, very negative. He didn't really grasp uh, uh, Vygotsky's key idea. He developed parts of it though, and he had insights, which to me are invaluable in getting out of psychology into social theory. His own theory is, is absolute uh, untenable as a social theory. You'd be laughed out of the ballpark if you try and put that across in you know, a general audience. But uh, he, he sketched out some ideas um, to utilize the Hegel part of Vygotsky for social theory part. And I value him for that. Then you've got Engstrom, who's usually this works usually what people mean nowadays when they say activity theory. Again, this guy uh, has made a contribution. He, he's dealt with some of the problems in Leontief, some of his limitations that I think came from his, him working in the Soviet Union, has brought it out into the modern times. But um, in my view, Engstrom's work, you can put it, it's like a bit of a sect. You know, it's been reduced to this uh, parody of this this wonderful magic triangle and of course you know you, it's one of these things you either wear the logo and you remember or you don't you know and I'm not right and I, I respect Engstrom he's done some great work 
uh, and contributed some good ideas, but I, I can't count myself a part of his movement because it's like joining a company or, or, or yeah. something. So f for me, uh, I, I see a, a, a r array of different currents following on from Vygotsky's work. And it's the same with Marx and the same with Hegel. So there I mentioned the three people who are important to me, the three lights, if you like, of my scientific life. Mm. I see a diversity of currents and I'm happy to appropriate from any of them what I find valuable. Yeah, so it, yeah, it's, a, um, it, it's not like an eclectic thing because all, all these people are part of a, a, of a common tradition of thinking. So there, there, are, there are basic tenets and approaches that are shared in common. So it's possible to appropriate the ideas to, to make them my own uh, in, in a careful way where you, you point out what is wrong and what's inconsistent in them uh, and then make appropriate corrections or adjustment with them to fit them into a, a consistent scientific theory. But I'll happily mine anyone from any of these traditions following from Marx and Hegel and Vygotsky to try and develop a scientific theory. And, and I, I don't want to identify with any orthodoxy mm. at all. It, the, the only orthodoxy is science, evidence, you know, and logic. That, that's all. And sorry, evidence and logic and the ultimate aim for human emancipation. Uh, otherwise, there's no givens. What, is that last, what does that last clause mean? The ultimate aim for human emancipation? Uh, and if this is if this is going to be a long the tangent, idea, then then feel free to skip the question if you'd like. No, no. Human emancipation means the, the the interest, the reason why you're doing something is to make people free. Now, that's an ill-defined answer because it immediately poses, "What do you mean by free?" That's fine, but we have uh, the basic principles of logic and evidence to 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 examine what's meant by free, but the 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 aim of what you're doing is still to make people free. There are contradictory ideas about what it means to be free. That's okay, but they can be argued out. If there's agreement that the aim is human emancipation and not increased productivity, for example, or, or anti-communism, or uh, domination of the earth, or for that matter, harmony with the earth. You know, and the, the aim of the investigation, the project is human emancipation, and the tools are basically evidence and logic. So, <clears throat> yeah? so, so freedom is the number one. So, freedom is the number one objective. That's the objective. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but that, that, freedom is is very very concrete concept. And I don't pretend for a moment by simply telling you that, that that settled the question. No, no, of course. Because we could spend the next hour discussing what freedom means. Yeah, and possibly, we, through, we, possibly through email, we, we will do that. Yeah. And, and I, will say, yeah. I will say a couple things about you, because um, we have a lot of exchanges uh, through email, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a lot of things that we don't exactly see eye to eye on. But I really value these exchanges. I think we treat each other with uh, a great deal of respect mm -hmm. and interest, and it's it's really cool. And um, when you say when you say you don't you try not to align with any uh, orthodoxy aside from the principles of science, I, I've seen a lot of evidence of that a lot in in public and private exchanges. I think that's very cool. Mm -hmm. um, one thing where my mind is going now is this, this emphasis on freedom. Um, it's, it's a major topic. It's a major focal point of the right, the right wing, the American right, at least I can speak to. And, and also of the emancipatory left, I guess we could say. And it's interesting that freedom is such a, such a uh, lighthouse principle towards both of these different sides. Mm -hmm. And so I do have a question, just out of curiosity. Um, uh, what do you think the American right, or maybe the Australian right, uh, what did they get most wrong about Marxism, in your opinion? And, and then what would you say they get most right as well? 
And if you're not really familiar with the critiques, then we could just skip this question. That would be fine. Because, and because, of, you know, because this is a, this is a, I, I'm sorry to interrupt this. Now this is a term that's being really just thrown around more than I've ever seen it thrown around in the past like decade or two. So. Yeah. With, there's one exception I'll mention, a type of exception, but generally speaking, the, what I've heard right-wing people say about Marx or Marxism simply shows that they haven't bothered to study it. It's just recycling prejudices. You know, anyone, any right wing I've heard that said something about what Marx said or believed simply hasn't bothered to pick up a book and read what he said. Right? So I can't pay much attention to that. There's no critique to be made. There are exceptions of that. Uh, people like uh, Frank Faridi, uh, who himself was a Marxist, a leader of an extreme left wing group in Britain for a while, who currently uh, does consulting work for um, the IPA, which is, what is it? Um, the Institute for Public Affairs, which is a right-wing think tank. You'd know about think tanks because you have invented, America invented them. And he works basically for the right wing now. And he utilizes Marxist rhetoric against feminism and things like that. Um, so he knows his Marxism. He knows very well what he's doing. But the, your, your general conservative or neoliberal simply never bothered to read Marx. It's just recycling opinion. It's a rhetoric. They're saying, it's like I heard at the Republican National Convention today, the news that uh, Biden is planning to bring in a centralized planned economy. Now, clearly, that's nothing to do with what Biden said. So it's no good to say, how did they get Biden wrong? Because clearly it's nothing to do with examining what Biden says. It's a rhetorical device. So generally speaking, what right-wingers say about Marxism is nothing to do with Marxism, it's simply a rhetorical device. It's like a bogeyman, a nemesis to fight against. Um, if they wanted to understand Marx, very easy. All his works are on a website that I manage. Just dial in marxist.org and you can read thousands and thousands of pages of what Marx said. Go to the Communist Manifesto. It's all laid out in very clear terms and argue with that. But no right winger ever does that. They don't bother. You'll find in Wall Street, some people that have read Capital, but they're not the people you, you know, who actually like it uh, or use it to make more money, but um, they're not the people you're talking about, I think. Yeah. So, okay, so thank you. It sounds like you're saying uh, that the, the weakest part of the right-wing critique is that they point more toward results. They point more toward like results some of the bad, some of the worst results of Marxism rather than to the texts themselves. Is that accurate? Well, see, what do you mean by the worst results of Marxism? See, the, the, that's really a loaded con concept, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. I, I think you're talking about what happened in the Soviet Union. Now, here we have a country led by people that's killed more Marxists than Hitler. And you say, this is a result of Marxism. I mean, rubbish. Yeah. If, for example, uh, my house is burning down, I come home from my house burning and I run in, try to save my children, but, you know, uh, can't do it. The flames are too bad. I come out really, you know, badly injured and things. And they say, oh, here's this guy killed his wife and kids because I didn't manage to get them out of the house in time. You know, it's about as good a lo logic. What happened in, in the Soviet Union is an historical fact that happened. It's not, you know, an extension or a result of Marxist theory. It's a result of the invasion of Russia by 14 countries that reduced um, the country. I mean, at one stage, the revolution held onto the suburbs of, of Leningrad or Petrograd, as it was at the time, and nothing else. You know, starvation, plague. You know, the, the country was absolutely destroyed. And what sort of, what sort of societies grow out of scorched earth? When, when you have a civil war, what sort of societies grow out of the ashes? You know, if you, if you bomb a country back into the Stone Age, to quote a famous 
you know, a countryman of yours, what sort of society do you think is going to grow up out of that country you're blowing back to the Stone Age? Yeah. So what grew up in the Soviet Union after the country had been absolutely decimated uh, was not pretty. Mm. Nothing to do with Marxism. Jesus. Marxism is, is, a, is a movement for emancipation. You know, I just explained that, 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 it, that you couldn't be a Marxist unless you kept your mouth shut in the Soviet Union. I mean, Vygotsky was obviously a Marxist. I've said, in a sense, he was the best Marxist of the century, you know, on one criteria, you know, don't get carried away with that. But uh, um, he, he, his ideas were suppressed. So where's the results of Marxism there? So... Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad we went there too. And, and I'm going to responsible. Yeah, and I'm going to pause just one second, just because I have to just say hello. I have to just say a quick good morning to my wife, and then I'll be right back in one minute. Uh, so th this this project of it's, mine is is very much uh, uh, selfish, I guess. Um, I I'm just trying to learn about things that I want to learn about. Um, from people who know more about okay. these topics than me, and in some okay, that's good. And the some, little some videos are a spin-off from that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I mean, uh, the 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 target audience is me, and and quite honestly, when I have conversations, especially if they're recorded, it could be a little nerve-wracking at times, and I'm focused as sometimes as much as what I'm going to say or ask next as what the other person is saying. So my attention, which is not extremely well developed as it is, my attention is somewhat divided. So I was walking with my daughter last night, explaining this to her. Um, she's like, why do you listen to your own videos? And I said, because then I could understand mm. it the second time. And, and quite honestly, like mm. for the past five minutes of you talking, I was fighting off three or four different questions in my head and not even fully grasping every single word. So when I listen to it a second or a third time, I'll have a much richer understanding. And that's a, I guess, a limitation of how my, how my mind works. So this is really a selfish project, but if anybody else gets any benefit from this, and, and I say that because when I was first starting to study Vygotsky, I got a lot of benefit from videos that you had made, uh, Nikolai Varasov, um, mm -hmm. it was just really great to have some sort of external, you know, uh, resources out there. So, okay, that's all good. Yeah, so I just want to I want to reassure you that if if you think this is not valuable in any way, that would be a mistake. So, okay, that's good. Um, uh, so I do want to ask you a little bit more about Vygotsky and. Let's see, let's see. Um, I'll give you two questions and take the one that you want. Uh, like, can you trace your specific pathway to Vygotsky? That's question number one. If, we may have covered that partly. And then number two is, is there any, within Vygotsky's larger sphere of work, is there, are there any certain areas that you feel like you have expertise in? Like, are you, are you more comfortable with some of his stuff than others? Okay. My, my own path to Vygotsky is this. Uh, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, I was part of a Trotskyist group in uh, London, which uh, it developed an interest in the work of Ilyenkov. And so, along with a lot of other people in that group, we studied Ilyenkov, uh, among other things. Ilyenkov is the uh, philosopher that developed Vygotsky's basic ideas and the ideas of activity theory, uh, mainly in the sort of 60s and 70s, and was translated into English in the 70s and 80s. Um, when I returned to Australia in uh, 1985-6, and then I eventually had a job at Melbourne Uni in my job was to be in charge of the teaching spaces. And I found a lot of, when I got appointed to that position, I found a lot of problems with the teaching spaces. The conception I was appointed with was that there was a matter of maintaining the equipment. And I'd done a good job in maintaining the, the building management system. So they thought that 
that would I'd be able to do this. But I discovered that wasn't so much the problem. It was the whole design. And I, at, in this job, I was interacting with teaching staff at the university and they were moaning and complaining to me about how the, the spaces weren't designed for collaborative learning, which is what they wanted to do. Uh, and so I worked with these uh, academic staff. Uh, I had a collaborative project with them to create uh, teaching spaces which would be suitable for collaborative learning. So it was a lovely circle in that which I was very uh, conscious because collaborative projects was how they taught and I engaged in the collaborative project with them. It was a, a very exciting experience because it put me in head-on conflict with the leadership of the university. It didn't like what we were doing and it was a political fight uh, which I won and we made these new spaces and they've proliferated around the world. But in the course of that, I just interacting with these academics and getting into what they, their ideas, I then found that they were all followers of Vygotsky. Mm. And then around about the time I've got this text arriving, the uh, 1962 translation of Thinking and Speech. So then I sort of became a convert and I had this the one practical experience uh, of, if you like, using uh, um, cultural psychology, activity theory, or whatever, in a, a transformative project, which wasn't a psychology, but was like more at the level of sort of Engstrom's work of, of, of in, in, in organizational change within the university, which then proliferated. So uh, they were the two arms. I, I got it politically. Uh, because Ilyenkov referred to Vygotsky as the source of his ideas, but I never got to read the original. Then I read the original at a time when I was working with other people on a practical project around these ideas. And at about the same time, I then, I think I must, one of the teachers must have put me onto XMCA. So I signed <laughs> up to XMCA and started engaging in this dialogue with these amazing people. Because back in the nineties, uh, you had much more uh, interaction from old hands, you know, leading academics, translators, theorists of it, uh, less so, you know, the, their preponderant weight in the discussion was larger. So it was such a privilege to be able to ask questions, get answers to these people, yeah. you know. And then um, at around about the same time, you know, I, I, I really, um, my own political development took off, you know, I was in a sense uh, broke with the orthodoxy, because you're looking at the, of course, in the same time as the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, I was never a Stalinist. But as Trotskyists, we always thought that when the Soviet Union collapsed, it'd be a wonderful thing and every, you know, there'd be a, a revolution inside Russia. And when it didn't work out like that, a lot of, it caused a lot of rethinking, you know, about understand how bad no, we knew it was bad in the Soviet Union, but we didn't realize how bad. So uh, I really started reworking my Marxism. I started thinking about the ideas practically in this project, working with other people, uh, talking to XMCA, reading Vygotsky. Uh, and, and so then I, I developed. Now, I retired a couple of years after that uh, with a specific purpose to, uh, to write, to read and to write. Uh, so to go on to answer your second question of what areas of Vygotsky's work do I have some particular expertise in? It's in understanding his basic concepts, yeah? Which is a silly thing to try and say you're an expert in a concept. Uh, and like, how can you be? You know, is that something separate like up in the sky, separate from actually using it and doing work. Uh, but that's the reality of my life, you know. My life hasn't been as an academic, you know, theorist. My life has been, I mean, my entire working life, I was the trade union rep for wherever I worked, right? So I was engaged in struggle and, and, and organisational change all my working life. And, you know, my, my reading and study was on the side of that. And, and the idea was to get out of, work and trade union activity and, and political activity to a certain extent too and just do this theoretical work because I found in this current of thinking what I recognized I've been looking for 
you know, that, that brought Hegel and Marx and a, a new insight into them uh, together. Um, so particularly the, the basic ideas of, of unit of analysis and, uh, and uh, some, I think the, the concept of Perez of Anya, which I didn't pay much attention to in the early days, but gradually I began to realize its importance and I've made, I've written on that and I've made a particular study. Um, and th those ideas I've taken out of the area of psychology and I, I use them in understanding uh, social change, right? Ha you know, um, social movements and, 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 and social historical change. Uh, and that's not really, um, that's my area of interest. Mm. Can you, and, but can you give an, can you give an example of that? Uh, sorry. Can you give an example of that? Well, at the moment, I'm working with uh, a fellow who lives in a very repressive country, which I won't name. Uh, and he's, we're making a study of the crisis of the regime in that country. And um, uh, I've uh, been able to work out a method of study where we, buy, we find a germ cell of that regime, it's, it's essential original basis, and so that we can then trace its historical development to understand uh, how at a certain, you know, how it's becoming into a crisis now and opportunities arise for, for dramatic change. So uh, my, I'm working with a fellow who's on the ground, keeping his head down so it doesn't get cut off, um, working in this very oppressive regime, but he has access to the archives, to newspapers, to talking to others. He can do all the detailed concrete work, but the isolation of living in a repressive country means that it does, you know, uh, the chance to talk to someone like me, you know, and, and work out how to approach it, to be able to work his experiences together. So that, that's a current project for me. Um, so you take unit of analysis, and I use that approach to handle a, a, a problem like the uh, rise and fall of a regime, a oppressive regime. Yeah. And I would imagine, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a formula. You know, people, mm. somebody, oh, give me an example. Like you can just pull some, you know, oh, it's a molecule, you know, like H2O. Yeah, you understand it all. Um, but you might just take some country, it might, you know, I don't know, Italy, and look at, at, at uh, what, what's the essential nature of the Italian government at the moment and try and, and understand where that comes from and what it is in the nature of Italian politics that makes it like it is. Yeah? So you go into that with the same mythological framework. You take the Italian politics. I haven't done anything with Italian politics, done anything about it, right? Um, but that's the whole that you're looking at, the science, right? So I do a circle because Hegel would see it as a circle, mm -hmm. whereby the, the entry point to the circle is some simple something, something you understand viscerally, not a theoretical concept, some Latinism, you know, that's in the air, but something that you understand by touch almost. You can feel it in your gut. You understand like if two people did this together, yes, I understand that, yeah? And then once you've found what that specific relation is, and of course you have to understand the circumstances in which it comes about, then you can see the dynamics of it and how it develops, you know, into what you've got. And then once you've got the logic of the thing, you can begin to understand the whole. How do you, and that's what how, Vygotsky did with the intellect. How does, how does one Vygotsky know... Was in, the, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Vygotsky took the problem of, of the intellect. He said, what's the, the intellect is, is verbal thinking, symbolic thinking, thinking with, with symbols. And so he took it down to its simplest unit, but also in a genetic way. In its simplest unit, not only logically, uh, or logically, can I put it, but in sort of two ways, because he took it as word meaning and he didn't generalize that like as, as artifact mediated action because that's a generalization that, that's actually abstract 
and it's got a certain value, but you don't use artifact-mediated action to understand the intellect. You have to take something concrete, which is a, a, a word meaning, as doing something, meaning something, an intention embodied in a word, and that's the, the unit and germ cell of the intellect. This amazingly complicated thing which defines you know, what it means to be human, uh, he got that. So the idea is when you, you, if you understand that idea, you can take that approach in any discipline at all. And it's not a formula. It, it's just any more than the basic idea of, of gaining evidence, thinking logically. These are not formulas. You know? Uh, you know, if you want to give a formula to how to get evidence, yes, that's the formula and it will probably fall over. If you want to write a, you know, some rigid book on, on logic that says, you know, this follows, this follows this, that'll probably fall over as well. But just the general principles, that's not a formula. So um, that my expertise is in particularly this concept of, of unit of analysis or germ cell, concept of Perijivana, mm -hmm. one example, and the use of these principles particularly the Hegelian principle of unit of analysis on a wide range of sciences as an interdisciplinary method. Yeah. Interesting. Um, when have you, when has your uh, diagnosis of a unit of analysis been really spot on? And when have you misidentified a particular unit of analysis. I mean, at a large scale, small scale, <laughs> even maybe in a, in a, in a personal relationship. Because um, from what I'm hearing, this is a concept, while, while not a formula, it's a, this is an analytical approach that is really uh, di mm. uh, diversifiable. Um, good question, because I ought to be able to tell you where I've got it wrong. <laughs> as well as where I maybe got it right. Otherwise, you rightly suspect that there's just some sort of form of words going on here. I'm cautious in saying X is a unit of analysis, really. I, I, I've, I've see it. I think in, in an article I wrote for the um, symposium at Deakin University, it's coming up next month, um, I managed to, I think, list something like 36 different units of analysis, uh, mainly out of Hegel's work. I don't say these are units of analysis, basically. These are units of analysis that have been developed by people that use this method. You know, uh, Hegel, Marx, um, Bogotsky, Leontief. Um, my, my own original um, identification of unit analysis is limited. I think the case I referred to where I'm working with somebody else in, in analysis of a, the politics of a particular oppressive country uh, is, the, is the sole case because it, it, it does require this detailed concrete work, which, you know, for the, as you know, for the, most of the last 13 years, I've hardly been able to get out or keep an appointment because I was, in a, I was carer for my partner. And even then, you know, before that, having been out of the union movement, out of work, um, my opportunities to actually do research just weren't there. Um, it, it, it requires research. You can't get a unit of analysis just off the top of your head. It's not obvious. Yeah. If, if it, because it isn't a form, it requires research. My opportunities for that kind of research are limited. So I've been able, in the one case I know, I quoted it because it's something I have at all. The, the other case, <laughs> of course, was the, the, the uh, teaching space. Yeah? The, we, we eventually sat down and we, we had a, it was, we, we got one particular academic and we sat down, right, you, you know, let's put together what your basic unit of teaching is. And we had a sort of a diagram and you had, you, re, you said you wanted a bit of text which could come from outside and the students would both be able to work on it, as a, they'd be able to work on it as a group, share it with other groups, put it back outside where they can work on it 
um, you know, outside of class, right? So we, we just did a little diagram showing that happening. I said, right now, you know, I'll come back and see you in a couple of weeks. I'm going to talk to technical people and the, the building people and we'll see how we can make this work, mm -hmm. right? And so th that, that, was, that was very, you know, exciting experience for me because here I was doing it, you know, in a very, very practical sense. It wasn't, well, it was psychology. You had educational psychologists discussing what was the appropriate distance between uh, students so that we, they could sit at the same table and have the optimum interaction, allowing that some of them came from a variety of uh, different cultural backgrounds and wouldn't want to be sitting too close to each other. And we, so we had to, you know, it, it was a psychological problem in the proper sense as well. Um, so that was a unit of analysis that we, we had. And then we replicated that in concrete and steel and timber uh, in, 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 around the university and exported it. Um, I might say Indiana University uh, was doing the same thing at the same time. Mm. So I, we weren't quite the first in the world to do it. The people in Indiana were, were doing it as well, but otherwise we were the first. Um, and then this case I've just mentioned. So I haven't had a chance to get it wrong because I, I, I've been aware of my own limitations. Yeah, but it's a great question. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting. I have like six different directions I want to go, but I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of your time as well. Um, I know. My, my time is fine. We <laughs> okay. could talk for 12 hours if you like. Okay. okay. Your Sounds time, good. I think, may be problematic. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I, I like the way, let's see, I like the way you've referenced six or seven different Vygotskyan concepts and that you said one of your <laughs> one of your areas of expertise is in like the basic concepts of his work so here's a difficult question for you mm. um what is his how would you describe his theory how would what is vygotsky's theory in simple terms it's not simplistic what is vygotsky's theory yeah um he, his theory is is cultural psychology. And Wagoski always answers questions like this in a genetic way. The, you had coming out of the 19th century two currents of psychology. You had your brass instrument psychology, which could be was carried out in the lab and for instance managed to measure the time it takes for a nerve signal to get from the finger to the brain, for example. Oh, in its time, a wonderful um, discovery, right? That you could measure something like that. And then on the other hand, cultural psychology, as it was called in one particular variation, which developed psychologists by studying the literature and, and, and cultural life of the community. And, and what Wagotsky did is he brought these two together. And exactly as I explained, psychological subjects in the lab and in between the two of them, uh, an object taken out of the culture. And then look at how those two use this object together. So that's the germ cell of Vygotsky's psychology. Now, it develops from that because that basic idea of taking your problem and, and, and putting it into a succinct germ cell, he then applied more generally in psychology. So as um, Hegel said, that simple something must be concrete. Now, concrete has a specific meaning for Hegel. Uh, in sort of orthodox Marxism, we call it a unity of opposites. But basically, something is concrete if it's the coming together of two different things. So Vygotskyan psychology was a coming together of two streams, brass instrument and cultural psychology and they were united in what we call cultural psychology or I, I do right um just give me a second mm -hmm. right so that idea then which was first instantiated in almost famously instantiated in word meaning then is found in a series of other units of analysis and that's the characteristic of his work 
that he found that simple something, simple concrete something, which would be the entry point, the beginning for a science. So when he went into disability studies, he actually, um, who's the guy that does um, uh, Adler, the inferiority complex, right? Alfred Adler. He, he, he appropriated Adler's work, right? But he, he formulated it that the, the unit of analysis is a defect, some, something in the person's you know, body or, or psychology that's sort of missing something, and the compensation. And both of these terms are relative, right? So there's no absolute defect. The defect is just a difference, right? It can be a superpower as well. As you would know as a parent, a child can have a superpower, which actually acts as a deficit when they get out to school and mix with other kids, they have to hide it, right? Like a super bright kid will pretend they're dumb and not know the answer mm. to teachers' questions so that they don't, you know, uh, did, did get into have, trouble with the other kids. Yeah, did, did, did you ever have that experience of, of some sort of superpower that you kind of had to hide oh, in school? Oh, it was a mild case. Okay. You know, I, I had to make sure not, not to be, get the reputation of being a brain, right? Mm. Uh, not, not, you know, I was just in, I was in the normal, you know, uh, the, the normal curve. I wasn't out mm. on a limb anywhere, but you have to keep yourself in the middle. Um, but so you have, this defect is an unfortunate word, it's really a difference, but you didn't have that political correct issue in Soviet Union at the time. And then compensation is also relative. The compensation could be the larger community uh, changing things to include the person, or it can be the blind person that develops fantastic hearing or touch or something or a way of using a stick. So you take this unit uh, and, and then you, 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 you build out of that a uh, whole understanding of, of, of the life of someone with a, a superpower or a defect whatever it may be. So that there, you've got the, the methodological core, which is already created with these artifact media, mediated action, no artifact mediated action and defect compensation, but it's still the same of a, of a, of a simple unit, like the person that's compensating, or the person who's got a, a difference that's being compensated for simple right and then all builds out of there this is the method recommended by hegel and exhibited in his encyclopedia of philosophical sciences first written in 1817 right uh, then you had um the social situation of development which uh, as, as as i formulated it's the uh it's the relationship between a child and its environment its caregivers mm. it's a relationship uh, and it represents the concept that, that uh, the community, the little community around them, which I get that concept from the larger community, has of the child. So you are an infant, you're a preschool child, you're a teenager or whatever. Mm. Um, and this means that you have certain needs and certain means of, of satisfying those needs, and they're non-identical. So... Mm as a person develops within this relationship, be that infant, each, in, each relationship is a specific concept. As you grow up, you move into different concepts. Um, so you're allowed to do certain things. You have, you're expected to have certain needs, but in that you develop ability to sort of look over the horizon and you develop new needs. You, know, you see your big brother walking around, whereas you're stuck in this little cage how can you get the move about as well? And you start fighting against it to get out into it, to be recognized and to learn how to operate in a new concept like your big brother, who might be a toddler instead of an infant or whatever. And so, so all that goes. So again, he's gone into child development with a key idea of a concrete concept, a simple visceral, when I visceral, I mean you can understand it with your body. You can feel it doesn't need any theory to explain it, right? So you, you know you've understood it. Uh, and then that you see how that, if you've got the internal contradiction, the fact that there are two different things that have come together in that unit, then that's what drives 
the, the, the change, the, the, the development. The uh, society expects you to become an adult in X year's time. You expect to have all the rights and privileges of an adult, but you, you're not there yet. How do you get there? It's this mm. continual revolution of overthrowing infancy to become a toddler, overthrowing toddlership to become a preschool child, you know, overcoming children to become a primary school kid and so on until eventually you leave home and say your parents were a load of shit and they didn't know what they were doing and eventually you come home, you know, when you're in your 20s and say, Jesus, Dad, I'm sorry I said all those things. It's really great. I agree with everything. You're a great father. Um, I have a, I have then a you had uh, Perez. I have a quick question as far as uh, the continual revolutions from one sort of stage to the next. Is, is, is that something that happens incrementally or is there, are there like lightning bolt moments? Um, is there, is, are there, is there like a, is there like a clear mark? Is there like a clear marker between when one is sort of, and, and, and okay, think about that just for a question. second. I, ha I have to pause, please. Just one minute. Okay. I'm sorry for that. Okay. You're asking me about, you're asking me about in, in child development, the relationship between the, gradual and the continued, the discrete, mm. the sudden changes. Yeah. Now, the basic idea of it is this, that change takes place by the alternation between periods of gradual adaptation when the subject adapts to its environment and develops gradually up to a certain critical point beyond which it can't develop any further. And then the subject changes the frame. It changes the environment so as to adopt a new position. So the infant develops all the, um, the abilities, the, the, the being an infant, uh, and there'll be the leading activity that's appropriate to infancy, which will lead their development. And I get to a certain point and say so they, they develop ability to kind of perceive uh, a way to be different and that they can't do it because they're an infant. They don't have the ability to act uh, as a toddler um, and they're not recognized as a toddler. They're still being treated like an infant. So what they do is they overthrow that relationship. It's not just that they make a leap in development, they do well, but the thing is that they, they, they sort of demand to be treated differently. And eventually in a healthy development, the parents recognize that there's a change taking place the child's demanding to be treated differently. They start treating the child differently and then the child grows into this new relationship. At first, they can't do it. You know, so like the, 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 the teenager that is developing their own social position uh, will tell you that you're all wrong about your views on mm -hmm. this or that, but they don't have the experience of the wider world to explain to you why you're wrong. They just say, oh, whatever. Right, so this sort of happens. But I mean, a few year down the track, they'll give you a reasoned argument to why you're wrong, and a year later, they'll tell you you were right in the first place. But it's um, so that's what it happens gradual adaptation to the environment, uh, critical or relatively sudden uh, overthrowing of the environment, change of the relationship to the environment. Now, these critical periods are the periods during which there's the development of the will. Right? It, 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 Trotsky's, sorry, well, Trotsky, Vygotsky's are uh, wonderful in the sense the will isn't just some fixed given thing. At each of these uh, stages, the critical phase is when the, the child changes its relation to its environment, it develops a different aspect of the will, becomes a different kind of will. Mm. Right? And you have to read the work to, 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 to put meat on that. But the will becomes, you know, a, a concrete thing in the course of development through childhood into adulthood to you at a point where, in a sense, you can run your own life. Yeah, you have to obey the law. You have to live in a society and earn a living. You're not like, uh, can you put it, in that, in that ridiculous kind of uh, libertarian uh, utopia where you can just wish for something and it appears. Yeah, but you are free. There's no one telling you how to live your life. You live as an equal among equals. Yeah, but to get there, 
requires this, uh, the will itself has to be developed and it develops during these leaps. Now I remember talking to Mike Cole once, I said, Mike, during these gradual periods, is development going on all the time? Yeah, it's gradual. What about when you're asleep? Hmm. Oh, okay, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we have this, and it's done very well in, in Vygotsky's theory, the contradiction between continuity and discontinuity. But when you get down to it, continuous development is untenable. You can't just gradually develop. Development, even in its gradual period, is, is a, um, a series of tiny revolutions, but they're revolutions of adaptation, uh, of appropriation, not revolutions of overthrow. So the change is going on all the time, is all the time discrete moments of, of little tiny leaps and steps. But, but on the larger sphere, when you, the person goes through these periods in their life, when they change their whole relationship to the world, and the world treats them differently, but it's not all in their own head, mm. when, when they, they are seen differently by other people, uh, then I'm losing the track of this. The difference is that the, the, the relationship to the, the world changes as well in relation to them. Whereas the gradual change, the little revolutions are where the, uh, the person changes their relationship to the world a little bit by appropriating something. You're listening to me and you might not agree with anything I say, but you're learning something. You'll come out of this in a couple of hours, a different person than you were before, but you ain't Paul on the road to Damascus, I don't think, right? You'll learn some things, but you're still the same Anthony that you were before. But there are experiences in your life, maybe, you know, uh, when you, you, a certain moment, perhaps when you met your wife or in the months afterwards, when you really just became a different person, you realized that you're not that person any longer. This is the kind of life you're going to lead. And, and you, your personality was transformed. And maybe one time you got sacked from a job. You, you were doing the job perfectly well, you thought, and all of a sudden you're calling to the office, pulled out the door, and you had to rethink everything you're doing, right? And I don't know, you might have just passively accepted that and said, oh, I'm a shit teacher anyway, I deserve to get sacked. I'm not going to give up teaching, become a labourer. Or you might have said, that headmaster, he's done that to people before. I'm going to get hold of the union and we're going to straighten him out. And suddenly you become an active unionist instead of just a, you know, a, 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 a teacher. But, you know, like these things can happen to you that produce a change in the way you're seen by the world. And that's the difference that, that makes a difference, right? Um, so we've got, that's Perijavanya, I'm just describing that. Social situation of development, just a different take on Perijavanya, mm. um, appropriate to the conditions of childhood, uh, but the same basic idea of a unity between the way you see the world and the way the world sees you. Your, action, your relation, active relationship to the world under conditions of adulthood when you don't have a, a system of care and support around you. You're actually the head of the family, whatever, making your own living, voting for yourself. Mm -hmm. right? You're a, a sovereign person. Um, what else is there? Maybe Artifact, a little more, a little more uh, mediated action. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you're so on the road to freedom. Yeah. At, at, at the risk of derailing your, your line of thought, and, and please reject this question if you'd like, um, does this happen, uh, does this sort of developmental process happen at a collective level as well, like amongst groups of people? Or is this simply an yes, individual? Yes, it does. Um, you find in XMCA and on the list, people talking about it, where a teacher can take a whole class through an experience together and the whole class goes through a transformation where they all collectively get an insight into something and it's not just an individual experience. It's like they all grasp it because they, they manage to do it between them. Yeah, and, and, and the teacher uh, usually goes through a kind of transformation as well. 
um, you know, it would be different, but uh, it's described as an, uh, a phenomenon in the, the classroom. And uh, I remember, uh, I think M Mike recorded a, a talk he did, did when he was explaining Vygotsky's theory of development. I'm looking at this video and I say, this is straight from Marx. Doesn't he realize this? You know, I mean, Marx's conception of history is where you have a certain uh, set of social relations, the people, the society as a whole, uh, producing its means of subsistence, reproducing its social relations, and at a certain point, for some reason or other, the thing just becomes so dysfunctional, it, it can't work anymore, and there's a, there's a complete change. And, 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 and it would be some sort of revolution, you know, the, the Boston Tea Party or, or whatever it might be, and, and, and the, the, the system's changed, and then a completely new uh, thing starts happening. Right? So between colonial America and the America post-1776, uh, that 1776 was the period of our new, in which the whole of America went through that together. And that they changed their relationship to the rest of the world, and they changed the way they saw themselves, and that, that they set it in, in text what they thought of themselves, right? And, and there's a clear discontinuity in history there. Uh, the, we had a discussion on XMCA about a movie called Fate of a Man or Destiny of a Man, depending on how you translate it. It's a Soviet movie that was made in the immediate aftermath of the, the Great War. I call it the Great War rather than World War II because that's what it's called, or the Great Patriotic War, what they call it in Russia. Uh, the Great Patriotic War. And of course, you would know that the war for Russia was not like it was for anybody else. They lost 40 million people. Mm. They, they, the, the suffering of the Russian people is unimaginable, unimaginable. Um, and the, this movie uh, follows the fate of one man. It begins, you know, he's in his little village bringing in the harvest and he spots the love of his life and they're married and then the war comes. And he's off to the army, you know, goes through these awful, terrible battles. He gets imprisoned and he's in a prisoner of war camp where, where the, the conditions are unspeakable, of course, just sort of bodies and skeletons and things. But he escapes, goes back and, and joins the Red Army again and, 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 and goes into battle again and, and comes out somehow alive after all sorts of terrible experiences. The war is over, he goes back to his village and all his family has been killed in the meantime, right? And then he's sitting on the road and a little orphan boy walks past and he talks to the orphan boy. The boy's um, parents have been killed and then they walk off into the sunset together. Now, I asked, on the list, they had or I would discuss it separately on the list as well. Um, is this telling the Perezvanya of Russia and their experience in the Great Patriotic War? And Misha said, not only that, the film itself is a Perezvanya. The, the film, the making of the film, and the tens of millions of Russian people watching that movie all together, re experiencing that trauma and digesting it and coming to grips with what had happened to them and finding a way to go forward into the next part of their lives was the Perezvanya. And that was a collective action and the movie itself was an important part of that. Uh, it's, to me, it's an amazing movie. It's, mm. I mean, it's sort of made in 1945. You know, it's a Soviet movie and scratchy black and white, you know, but um, and you've got to accept the assumptions of the movie, of course, to understand it. But I think you would understand it because you're coming from a warrior family yourself. You would understand that. Um, so that's another example of a collective Paris of Anya. It's my thesis that the current coronavirus pandemic is a world Paris of Anya. That the whole world is undergoing a trauma and what will come out of the other side will be what the world decides to do mm. and for the first time it will be a kind of world decision that all the we're all being locked up in separate little 
compartments because we can't travel, isolated from each other. I mean, at the moment in Melbourne, we've got total lockdown. I can't even have visitors here. Mm. But what will come out of it will be this kind of recombination of people that will produce a new world. You know, the the the, we, the government here was a it's a it was a uh, conservative neoliberal government that, that was always going on about the, how we've got to get the debt down. We've got to cut all this welfare because of the debt. When the, the virus came along, they, 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 they've been paying the wages of everyone ever since. Yeah, they, they, they're uh, spending tens of billions of dollars you know, in the Australian context. And in America, that's an everyday thing for you. So suddenly everyone says all this business about debt was a fiction. The government can spend as much money as it likes so long as it can collect taxes, right? So that's just one of the things. We're having all these things and suddenly the mystery is being, being lifted and people are realizing that they can live differently. Um, so it's my thesis but yet to be established. This may be my first case of getting a unit of analysis <laughs> wrong because uh, I, 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 we, we won't really know to 10 or 20 years down the road whether this was a, 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 you know, a discontinuity in world history uh, and I'll be dead by then for sure uh, but that, that's a thesis anyway and it's uh, remarkable to, of course that at the moment the world is not wow. a collective in the sense that the Soviet Union was in 1945 we're still split up in different classes, nations, ethnic groups, you know. So, can the world actually? I, 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 you know, you know me. I, you know me. I like diversity. So, I like Good. this. I like. Yeah. I like split. Diversity <laughs> won't go away. But can yeah. We work together. This is the thing. Yes. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Despite diversity. Precisely. Yeah. I like. I like split apart. I like We're unique. On the same page. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Man, so what you got for me? I have, I have two questions that I'd like to combine together, and uh, you, you've kind of talked about this indirectly, but I'm going to ask you directly. Can can, can you explain what the dialectics of development is, if that's a, if that's a phrase that lands for you? And secondly, is there anything particularly Vygotskyan in your own personal developmental history? Uh, I just wanted to ask that openly. You can interpret that as you wish. Okay. I'll take it as two different questions. Mm -hmm. The first one, I tend to be repelled by phrases like dialectic of development. When I okay. hear them, I mean, not from you because you're asking about it, and that's a legitimate question. When I hear people using them as if everyone knew what they meant, then I know it's a kind of cover-up. The... I can apply a specific meaning to the dialects of development because in um, Hegel's logic, he assigns the word development to a specific phase um, when a, uh, a phase of development in the more general sense. So the, the development, as, as Hegel describes it in his logic, begins with the simple cell and then that cell or that unit of analysis becomes more concrete, right? But there's a whole stage before that, right? He calls that the subjective logic, the logic of something making itself more concrete, which it does by interacting with all the others and kind of merging with them and forming a new unity. And that goes on and on and on, so that the, the original subject has established relationships with everyone else on the field, and become till it's become itself a part of the whole. So it's like when a feminism comes along, establishes a relationship to the unions, a relationship to government, a relationship to gays, a relationship to the church, and so on. And then this, this all of course takes years to do this. But when it's gone through all these other institutions and changed them, then uh, like now, 50 years down the track since the beginning of modern feminism, it's really just part of the way the world works. It's not a separate movement. You won't find women marching for women's rights very often. I mean, I know what happens. People march for everything these days. But generally speaking, society has been changed. Women's rights are built into the way the world works. 
not perfectly, not the same in every country, every state, but that's the idea of it. Now that's development, but there's what Hegel calls objective, the objective logic before you get to that idea, like women's liberation. And, and, and that's the, all the movement, which is basically the interaction between a first guess at what we need to do with the experience of uh, what, with the experience of what's going on all the time, right? That struggle to find a way of making sense of things, a way forward. So eventually you come to uh, some idea that you can say, right, we, this, we can float this. So the dialects of development, Hegel referred to that last part, the concretization of the cell as development. But clearly what came before, before you get to that insight, before you get that abstract concept, which is going to be the beginning of a movement, the beginning of a new change in society, that's a development too. Um, so if one says someone's, I know that when people say the dialectics of development, they're not read Hegel, they'll be more precise about what they're talking about. So what do they mean? I don't know. It means just general things like it's not all straightforward. There are interactions going on between different parties. Um, there's, um, things happen surprisingly. Things happen without obvious causes. There are these general kind of um, negatives. Now, it's not like this, it's not like that. There's a paper of mine where I called um, non-linear processes in the dialectic. And I go through, because it used to annoy me, people in the XMCA would start saying, oh, it's very non-linear. Now, I'm an engineer and non-linear has very specific meanings for me, you know, but what do they mean when they say it's non-linear? You know, and so um, there's a hell of a way, a lot of ways something can not be linear. You know? And so in this paper, I go through all these different ways, that the ways that analytical science comes across the fact that analytical science doesn't completely manage to do the trick. And then the second half of the article, I think I spell out 13 different forms of movement, different manifestations of what you might call the dialectic. Hmm. So I'm saying there's not one thing you say, this is a dialectic, but I'll give you 13 classic forms that I've noticed, right? Um, of, of movement, of movement, and, and so, yeah. 13 different forms of movement, movement. Of, of, of what to, of what to what movement of, um, of, of a concrete something mm. becoming something different. That can happen in a lot of different ways. Uh, for example, you can have a law, someone brings in a law, mm. but um, the law has just been passed and there's some case comes up in court and the judge says, well, actually, they never mentioned this when they made the law, but X, Y, Z, we have to interpret it in this way. And then every time it goes into court, the judges have to make a, uh, an interpretation and the, that law changes by it's continually proving inadequate to a situation, didn't cover the circumstances that it was meant to. That's, that's one kind of change, a little bit like Darwinian evolution, right? When a, a basic relation to the environment goes along, but it has to get trimmed all the time and the creature gradually changes. And eventually, you know, as you know, another form of change when it's actually changed so much it no longer fits in its environment and has to basically find change the environment in order mm -hmm. to go on living, you know, or kill all its predators or something, um, or migrate. Now, the other question was an interesting one. What was that? Um, it was, are there any, the are one? there any particularly Vygotskyan, uh, uh, in moments life, yes. in your life. Okay, or... this is nice, isn't it? Don't people like talking about themselves. You see, if this is where you're on a winner, Anthony. People like to talk about themselves, what they think, what they know, what they've done. Now, look, you, you can't be. It would be a rotten theory that I could really answer that question because it's a general theory of development of of human beings, the general theory of human development. So, of course, my life exhibits it. 
uh, but I answer it in the sense of this. Of course, I've reflected on my own life and I've, I've reflected on the, my life in the light of the different concepts that Vygotsky has. Um, I can't remember my childhood. So the, the different theories he has about childhood, uh, I, I can't add anything to them in remembering my own life in that sense. Of course, I've had children as well. Um, uh, I haven't had children, well, I've been a father having got together with a partner who already had children. Mm. So I was a father of a few years of my life. It was a long time ago uh, and I didn't know anything about Vygotsky. And I've never actually done that reflection. Mainly, I can examine my own life in terms of Paris of Anya. I'm able, as reflecting in my life, to see those moments in my life when I had to change my relationship to the world. Mm. Um, and it's if you read an autobiography, pick an autobiography, anyone, and the person will go through and they will tell you those moments in their life when they had certain experiences, certain challenges, and how they dealt with them, and how this is, they might say, this has marked me. They may not say anything about it, but it's obvious that this is partly part of how they came to be who they are. Well, well I, I know I've reflected enough about my own life to be able to recognize those main experiences in my life that made me who I am. Yeah. The, the, the Paris of Ireland, yeah. And if I'm explaining Paris of Ireland to someone, you know, I have in mind uh, my personal experiences. I don't know, mention them, but that's mm. what's in my mind. Mm. Can, you, can, can you mention one? Example? Mm. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit complicated to get the background, but I, I was an engineer. I was responsible for the a building automation system. I'd inherited the system uh, from a person before me. Um, and it's supposed to control all the air conditioning and such like equipment in the university, all the pump alarms and heating and air conditioning and such like. Um, and it's meant to be uh, uh, to assist the work of the blue collar staff that manage the buildings. Mm. Now, the problem was it was a really ratchet system because you had all this equipment out there and we'd go along afterwards and take some wire in and connect up a, you know, a, a, a something to a part of the machine and take it back to the computer. And it cost a lot of money to do that. And um, we were really not getting anywhere. And the, the blue collar staff didn't trust the information from it. And we weren't actually controlling anything. We we're just measure, monitoring alarms and temperatures and things. Because what you needed to do was when the equipment was installed in the first place, Instead of, see what they do, every air conditioner's got its own controls. And it's just programmed to work in a certain way. And you don't have to go near it. It just turns on and off and gets the temperature in a certain range and away you go. Um, and then we come along and we connect the wire to it and we can say whether it's working or not, you know. But we can't interfere with it because it's, it's a self-contained system. What we needed was when the contractors installed the thing in the first place, they had not to put it in a control system, but simply connect it to our computer. And then we would turn it on and off according to the, the university semester time, class times. There's no good cooling a lecture theatre uh, on a Saturday afternoon uh, when there's no classes in there, you know. And of course you want to run the air conditioning, start it early on a hot summer's day, you get to cool the place down before, it, you know, the classes come in. Uh, so you need to know what the temperature is and you need to know the university schedule and, and so on. You need to be able to change it as forth as complaints. So but I, I, this was getting nowhere. We'd written, I got into together with a, a group of people to rewrite the project management guidelines to say that this is what you should do. Still wasn't happening. Incredibly frustrating. I felt like shit. I'm running this equipment, I'm spending the university's money and it's contributing nothing. So someone mentioned to me, oh, they're putting some new air conditioning in such and such a building. I'll go over and look. Now, I'm a level eight uh, higher education worker, which means I'm, can I put it, 
I'm not management. I'm a, you know, I don't attend the management meetings. I'm a level below that, but I've got one fellow under me, right, a technician that works under me. So I'm not right up there. The project managers, they're level 10s, mm -hmm. right? So what did I say? Eight. Yeah, I probably would have been an eight. Okay, so I walked down the steps into this basement and there's an electrician there wiring up this set of controls. I looked at him and said, that's no good, rip it out. It's got to be connected to our the university system. The electrician looks at me. Who's this guy, right? I look then a bit like I do now. Don't look like your average engineer, right? Mm -hmm. um, he said, I'll have to rip my boss, the builder. Okay, hold, on just, hold on just one so, sec, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, one second. Okay. okay. I'll get to the point of the story <laughs> quite quickly now. So I've said to this guy, rip it out. He looks at me like, what's going on here? He calls up his boss. His boss comes in. He's a builder. You know, he's in, he does this sort of work. I say, here's the you know, X, Y, Z. Here's what it's got to be. University's guidelines say it's, it's got to be controlled by our central system. Uh, got to rip it out. And here's the bit of paper that tells you how to do it. So he says to the electrician, okay, do it. Okay. And then, of course, the next day, uh, I hear from the project officer because, you know, I've done something I shouldn't have done. I've interfered in a building project, which I have no right to do. I'm two, it's two pay grades above me. And there's a contract telling them what to do that's already been agreed. So it's going to cost somebody money to do this. Um, and so I explained, look, this is how it's done. We've agreed this. It's in your procedures. You've got to do it. So I went to the um, the uh, construction manager, who's like one step below, sort of like the leadership of the university. And he said, yep, yeah, right. And he says, so that's right. And forever after, it was done properly. Mm. Right? It, it, they suddenly did it that way. Uh, uh, a year after that, I didn't have to be in that job anymore. The job wasn't needed. It ran itself, right? Now, the thing was that moment when I told the electrician, rip it out. It's like that moment we're in the zone, you know, like swimmers will tell you how the, what, what are you thinking about when you're doing that? I'm just in the zone. Mm. And this is an experience which you have with Perish of Arnia. Time sort of stops. Time stops. And that's, and it's, it's like all of the, the world, it's, it's not there. It's just goes foggy. And, um, I realized what I've done. I've, I've just stepped out of my role as a lowly kind of technical manager uh, and, and I've, I've insisted that things be done right. Hmm. Uh, and and the, 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 the university changed. And of course I changed hmm. because cause all my life I've been the union rep, you see, which sort of, I've been a part-time teacher when I was a teacher, you know, I was just a, a technician, the junior technician, the technical team, you know, I was always at the bottom of the management heap, right? I never had work responsibility. Um, my, my, my self was developed outside of work, my union work, right? Defending people, sticking up for the worker, so to speak, to use a cliche. And then suddenly I found that I could assert myself in that domain of work. And, 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 you know, like speak on behalf of the university as a professional. And th that, that flowed right over in, into my theoretical work, my union work and everything. Mm. I operated with a kind of freedom and self-confidence that I'd never had before. And of course, it could have gone differently. Mm -hmm. the, the construction manager could have said some day, Andy, look, get in your place, that bloody, you know, computer system of yours, it never worked properly, just get back in your lab and, and don't need the fear of building projects again. He would have been perfectly in his rights to do so. But because I jumped out of my skin and acted as if I was the, the authority on this question, which technically I was, you know, but organisationally I was just a shit kicker, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I, I acted up in that sense, he responded to me in an appropriate way and said, yes, the project office has been getting this wrong. Thank you for pointing it out. We will put it right henceforth. Right? Um, and there've been, you know, that's an experience which is a once in a decade experience. 
and you know I have others that I can remember and I can trace the formation of my own personality uh, through those moments and I'm sure mm. if you reflect on your own life take a little bit of time working over things so I think that those moments will jump out at you yeah? would you say you didn't uh, just change mm. yeah and and would you say I could hear a number of different themes in that story that you told what is what are what is one theme uh, that jumps out to you because of course a, a, a story is a particular instance of maybe a larger a larger pattern what's the larger pattern represented in that story for well, the larger pattern I'm sure there have been lots of movies made around the person who's a little nobody in the office who suddenly stands up and says in a loud voice hey you guys it's about time you did x right mm. it's a common theme of a, of a kind of a feminist movie maybe uh and then the person's they're quaking in their boots they're holding a, a stiff face to the world but actually their, their knees are, are knocking together and they walk out of the room and think oh, <laughs> what have i done uh, and of course the whole office is going did you hear that jesus what was amazing i didn't know she was like that or whatever okay that person has changed they'll never be seen the same again and people will act differently now that's a that, that kind of thing as a person who suddenly acts way above what they're expected to do and gets away with it now you have the inverse type of thing where um a person maybe has a not i mean it all begins with a person having a certain idea of themselves which in a way is imperfect and my idea was imperfect in as much as i didn't realize my own power mm. and when for a moment i exercised it i discovered that i had it so my behavior caught up but it can happen the other way as well that someone uh, who may be for instance treated with great respect because they've been appointed to a position and they've developed an image of themselves as competent can suddenly find themselves in a crisis situation uh, where they're actually shown to be incompetent and humiliate themselves and that kind of humiliation is awful it's devastating uh, potentially and 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 why that can when that happens to a person what's important is how they respond to it right because it's all about not just the happening but the response you know? so the happening for me was having my work continually dissed and my response was eventually at a certain point i stood up to it right. and then the response to that reinforced right so someone can humiliate themselves at a certain point by not realizing perhaps the gravity of what they'd walked into now they can repair that damage and and just reevaluate themselves and feel good about that and say wow that was a lesson for me or that th they can just really go into therapy and and and, and feel utterly and go into retreat feel mm -hmm. shame guilt mm -hmm. yeah and never sometimes i've met people because i've been a union rep I've known people who've had bad experiences at work that are never ever the same again. Mm -hmm. They leave work on sickies and eventually they, they go off sickies and, and, and they're on the dole and that they might never work again uh, through that kind of humiliation. Um, so the thing about Perisivania is there's not just something happening to you, it's how you respond. So Russia, after the Great Protrotic War, and the terrible devastation they suffered got its act together looked at the younger generation coming up and decided to rebuild yeah. um i have so <clears throat> it's an important aspect of perigivania it's an active relationship to the world mm. i have something I'd, I'd like to point out um as you know sometimes we make little little wagers for fun or in other other ways um I would like to predict that your second wrong analysis in terms of germ cell. Oh, you'd like to predict? I'd like to predict 
another area where you are wrong in terms of your analysis. Oh. You, 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 claimed yes. early, you claimed earlier that in, in 20 years, you think you're not going to be here anymore. And uh, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's a failed prediction. And maybe, I'm just, <laughs> maybe I'm just hoping that's the case, but I think that's going to be a failed prediction. Well, I won't take out a bet on that. But let's because say it's definitely a loser, isn't it? <laughs> but let's say you're right, okay? And I'm going to predict I'm going to predict you're wrong. But let's say you're right, and 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 you're no longer here, and some people are talking about you, and they're and they're saying something like, uh, eventually he eventually he found his confidence and he 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 found his power, and he realized what he was made of, um, and here's what he did with it. What do you think people should say as far as what you did with your power as an individual, as a human, with your confidence? What do you think people should say or what would you like them to say? Um, I'll, I'll be remembered as, as, as someone that was a bit into abstractions. Um, but at the same time, people that have known me for a longer period of time will know that uh, I spent a lifetime in the day-to-day -day work of the local trade union branch. So I, I will hopefully be remembered as a communist and I've specified that the Internationale we played at my uh, memorial meeting, even though the kind of things I do and the way I talk at the moment seems at odds to something as sort of social realist as the communist, uh, as the uh, as the international, but I, I, I'll be. I hope I'll re be remembered as, as a communist that made my little contribution, uh, and that you know I, I was honest in what I did and had a kind of a role, of, of some kind of role as a teacher. I remember when I left England, and uh, things came together in my life, and I just just. We, uh, we had a union meeting, which was elect, going to be electing the secretary for the next year. And, and I was expected to, to be re-elected. And I, uh, the way the time worked, I announced, look, I'm stepping down because I'm going back to the country where I was born. And I wish you well. And someone at that time said, Andy, you have been our conscience. I don't know what we'll do without you. Um, I don't, I, that's going to put it, I don't see it that way. Um, but th th that's sort of how evidently I'll be remembered in England. Um, <laughs> people that knew me uh, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, people that knew me uh, maybe 10 or 20 years ago will remember me as a fellow communist. The people that have known me over the last decade or so will remember me as a teacher, a teacher of Hegel, a teacher of Vygotsky's concepts and so on. Um, unfortunately, the way my life's worked out, um, there's been not many people have known me over the whole time. So I'll mainly be remembered by the books I leave behind, I think. Um, my circle of friends is pretty narrow. People like you and Mike Cole and people scattered around the world know me. Yeah. Uh, the, the, my um, sort of ideas on immortality is, is that immortality lies in creating a concept. It can be a concept of yourself yeah. or a concept you add to a science, a concept you add to art, but concepts are eternal and it's the greatest joy of a human life to create a concept and to put it out in the world and for it to live. Concept isn't necessarily the abstract thing because for me, you know, concepts are, are, are forms of activity and a human being is a concept. So a, a father or a mother also creates new concepts and they have personal names, they're Sally and Joe, you know, but they're concepts. Um, and you know they are because you know what they're like. And so, on. Um, so raising a family, is one way of placing yourself in the posterity. I think we all want to do that one way or another. The strange person that's not interested in posterity at all. Um, for me, uh, 
it really is uh, through concepts. You know, I, I have, for instance, nailed down the history and meaning of, of unit of analysis, which is played in my view. In my view, that concept is the germ cell of Agotsky's science. That's the germ cell of his whole legacy. So right from my earliest interaction with the Monex MCA, understanding that concept and then working on it was my critique. Critique, understand it's not uh, an attack. Critique is an appropriation. Yeah? Uh, that was my critical relationship to the current has been centrally to establish that concept which is I see as the germ cell, the unit of analysis of, of cultural psychology itself is the unit of analysis. So uh, by trying to clarify that concept and rescue it from the confusion into which it was descending, um, that's I suppose what the, how I should be seeing. That's my main contribution to the world. And because it was able to do that, it actually doesn't belong just to the, that little community of Bogotskyists. It's actually something that's of value for, for science and therefore the struggle for freedom for everywhere. Whether it ever makes its way out more widely, that's for the future to see. But I, I do think that, that, that if, if Goethe was on to something there, yeah, and, and, and people still uh, puzzle over his concept of view phenomenon, which was what he called the unit of analysis, then you know, the, 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 it's possible that the, the, this concept, uh, as I've recovered it from the history of this current of science, may prove to have a life much longer than mine and may prove to be fruitful in the future. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Okay. <laughs> is, 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 we have a, a premier here that's like the state governor equivalent. And every day, somewhere around midday, he has a press conference uh, to update people on the, you know, what's going on with the coronavirus. And he stands there until the journalists have run out of questions. And he then said, any more questions? Any more questions? He went, no, nope, I'll be off then. Uh, and he's got quite a reputation for himself now because yeah. he's working 24-7. He's never missed a day at these press conferences since March. Yeah. And he stays there till the journalists have run out of questions. And, of course, that has a cumulative effect because you know what journalists are like. They try and trip you up. They ask you these questions for which there is no right answer. Mm. And they keep... You know, they've got some scandal that they've heard and ask you to react to it. They keep going and going, but eventually the, the bag of tricks begins to empty. So it, it gets to be... Anyway, it's, it's, it's quite Good interesting. strategy. So yeah. if you've got any more questions, than Anthony? No, one of the things, well, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll remember uh, about you and that I appreciate about you currently is your, your, op your, your firmness, your firmness and your own beliefs. But your but your open mindedness mm -hmm. to the fact that other people think different, and uh, and I think the mm -hmm. reciprocity there. And I think that's one thing that's nice about uh, our interactions is neither one of us is really trying mm -hmm. to flip flip the other or or even persuade the other. But just really try to understand uh, different points of view, and mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate that. So, yeah, it's I an guess. interesting pair of opposites you bring together mm -hmm. there firmness in my opinions and understanding that other people think differently it's mm. an interesting pairing isn't it yeah and and how and, and, and how could they thought right. about it before mm. but how could they not you know because just based, based on, if you just track this conversation and all the different uh developmental milestones or, or moments that people in different cultural situations or personal situations have, how, how could it be otherwise? How could it be otherwise where people end up having, you know, having different, Supposedly unique, independent, independent. More precise, don't we? Yeah. 
you need to make what you said a little bit more precise because it's not just recognizing that other people think differently it's respecting that other people can think differently okay, does that explain it it's accepting yeah that uh, that, not, that views different from your own however unimaginably different have some validity and yeah and mm -hmm. if you even just take a, a casual even just a, a surface look at some of the uh, uh, cognitive bias literature or or even the, the television show brain games which my brother is going to be a producer on um, the human the human mind is not uh, it's not really wired to be accurate a lot of the time so and so that that's a that's a domain I'm interested in so like by de that's where I'm starting from pretty much that that I, I know there are all sorts of cognitive tricks that the brain plays mine is no exception and uh, to, to, to start from some sort of um, place of certainty now firmness firmness is good the certainty is uh sometimes that's an error so kind of starting from there where the assumption is that uh other people have something to offer always you know and and, and you have something that you don't don't quite have nailed down so but but i'm sorry i'm sorry to sorry to keep talking but i, I have to say i have to kiss my wife off before she goes to work and I have to say good morning to my kids and uh, I appreciate your you time you going to come back? Um, yeah I'm going to come back you're going to come back? yeah okay where you go? Okay.